Good evening and welcome back to PVC Loud. Um, as you know, every other week we come up with you know one or two guests, important personalities, either contesting or either professionals, to discuss with you what's going on in the country, their candidacy, their chances, what they bring to the table, and what they're offering. We young Nigerians and you know Nigerians at large. Today I have with me a very interesting um, personality. Um, he is the candidate for the PDP, um, contesting for the ATLSA House of Representatives. I'm sure you already know who I was speaking about. The man is an entertainer, he's a philanthropist, he's, he's a professional speaker, come politician as well. He's a man of so many skills and talents. And I have here with me um, Oluban Kole Wellington. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. How are you doing, bro? I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing yourself? It's a pleasure, man. Thanks yeah. for having me on your show. It's great to have you here. It's great to have thank you, you here. So, I mean, what we do on the show, before we commence anything, I'd like our viewers to know who our guest is. Okay. You know, and they're contesting. But let us have a, you know, background of yourself. Let us know who you are, what you have been into, this and that. So, yeah. the idea is that they know who to vote and who not to vote for. Sure. Exactly. Sure. So, let's x-ray your... Your CV, okay. more or less. Okay, so my CV. Um, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Oluban Kali Wellington, uh, sometimes known as Banky W. I am a musician, a filmmaker, a, uh, an entrepreneur. I co-own a chain of fast food restaurants called Suya Bistro. Oh. I co-own a media and marketing agency called EME, the EME agency. It used to be a record label. Um, I have some investments in real estate and a few other um, business ventures as well. I am a teacher uh, in the church where I serve. I am a philanthropist. I do a lot of community service work, which I've been doing for many years, not just because I wanted to run in politics, <laughs> but not because I decided to run in politics. Um, let's see, I'm a husband to the most beautiful woman that has ever walked the face of the earth, Adesoa Tommy Wellington, if I do say so myself. And I am a father to the most amazing young man. He's 21 months old. His name is Hazaya Olushegun Wellington. In terms of my foray into politics, so for people who've been paying attention uh, in my 15 years or so of being relevant in the entertainment scene, I had always been very vocal about our politics, about the need for young people to get involved in politics, mm -hmm. about the need for us to push back against bad governance, about the need for us to do better as a nation, and for us to have better leadership. And uh, in that time, I probably have participated in more peaceful protests than just about anybody that I know, at least amongst my peers, um, in entertainment or in entrepreneurship. And so everything from uh, way back in the day, enough is enough, uh, light up Nigeria, bring back our girls, occupy Nigeria, uh, RSVP, the, the Register Select Vote Protect movement, um, down to the most recent NSARS. You know, most times I'm either you know on the front lines with the megaphone or on stage, you know, kind of leading the marches, or I'm in the uh, in the planning group, the WhatsApp group that you know that kind of plans mm. these peaceful protests. And you know, honestly, I've said this before, but I honestly believe that the truth. Um, the, the purpose of activism and advocacy is change and impact and improvement. So until you've seen the impact and the improvement that you seek, then your advocacy and your activism has not yet been completely successful. Mm. So while awareness is good and advocacy is good, it is a means to a desired end. It's not the end in and of itself. Okay. And so, um, you know, I would... I spent a lot of years being a, a very vocal advocate. But when it, it boiled down to it, I realized that, you know, as people who want a better nation, we cannot be satisfied with advocacy and activism. While it is good and it's very important, we must also find some of us who are willing to move from protest to power. And that's what informed my desire to say, you know, I wouldn't even call it a desire. I, I think it's more of a burden that it just felt like, you know, you know, I, I, I strongly believe the problem in Nigeria is from the top down, but the solutions are from the bottom up. So some of us have to kind of come in from the bottom and start to enter government, start to, start to populate government with like minds, with right-thinking people, 
at various sectors of, of leadership and get those people to start putting in the right policies, putting in the right laws, helping society chart a different course. And you know, it culminated in what I believe is my greatest act of protest thus far, which was running in the 2019 19. elections, which I did. And uh, we ran a campaign that most people were proud of. But you know, we didn't win, but I think we, 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 made, we gave a good account of ourselves. You know, it was, I say this, that uh, 2019 was about planting the seed, but now 2023 is about winning the seeds by the grace of God. Somebody say amen. 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 So, uh, so we ran in 2019, and fast forward a few years later, I wasn't sure if I was going to run again, but again, it's, it's a burden, you know? So it's something that you feel like it just it keeps coming back to you, and it feels like, well, listen, whether or not I ever like got it's a into, calling. It, it's a calling. That's mm. the way I look at it. And whether or not I ever get into government, I believe that I will on this round, I will always be the kind of person that makes myself available for service to the nation. So I'll mm. always do community service. The most popular community service uh, outreach that I have or that I've been a part of is Lecky Food Bank, mm. which we've fed over 100,000 people till date. And I'm so grateful for that level of impact. But it has to be more than that. It can't be about stopgap measures. We have to find a way to lift an entire generation out of poverty and need and lack. We have to find a way to lift an entire generation out of poor living conditions. We just have to do better as a community, as a country. And the biggest way that we can impact this nation and this generation of people is through our political system. Mm. And so we're here again, and, and hopefully by God's grace. I mean, that's, that's, I mean and, and you know, that's, that's quite good to see and interesting as well, because all we try and preach here is that um, politics and governance is a necessity for everyone. Absolutely. You know, we Absolutely. must be a part of it. Yeah. Otherwise, we leave it to people that might not be necessarily capable to yeah. run it. Yeah. And I see that that's what you're also trying to achieve it by also, you know, getting your hands into the roles and, you know, Yes, sir. See that things are done by yourself yes, and sir. not just anybody. Yes, sir. And that's, that's, that's interesting. But I, I want to also ask, why, why the House of Reps? Do you think House of Reps is, is the best um, avenue for you to um, produce change? Right. So, you know, um, that's an interesting question. I think that I've, I've had very many reactions to my choice of office. Mm. Um, some people have felt like, oh, House of Reps is too... No, that you know, you're a very popular face, you're a popular name, you should have gone for something that's, you know, that's more influential, mm. politically speaking. However, I'm not naive and I'm not delusional. You know, politics and popularity are not necessarily the same thing. You're, the number of followers you have on social media does not translate to the number of votes you get in an election at all. Mm. Um, some people have felt like it's too high, that it, you know, I should have gone for something lower. I will tell you what, in a perfect world, I might have considered going for a local government chairman. Um, because it's an executive seat, you know, there's a, you know, there's a budget that you can use to impact your community directly. Uh, there's more executive power. That, I mean, there is executive power uh, for people who may be tuned in. I know, I know we have a global audience. For people who are tuned in from outside of the country, local government chairman in Nigeria is like what the mayor mm. in Yankee is, right? Yeah. The problem is that our local government chairman elections are not handled by INEC. They're handled by the state electoral body, which so you is you don't have no faith in it? Well, it's basically an offshoot of the governor's office, you know. So for the most part, it's very... I, in fact, I don't know of any situation in the country yet where the local government chairman elections have uh, succeeded in going against the candidate of the ruling party because it's not handled by the independent electoral, but it's handled by the state. So it's very difficult to get that. So what I did was I looked at the rest of the available seats and said, where do I think I can have the most kind of impact? And it felt like, for me, for where I'm at, for the things God has done through me, for the community that I have served, for the mm -hmm. community that I seek to represent, it makes sense to come in at the House of Reps level. You're a federal lawmaker, so you have responsibilities from a lawmaking perspective for the country as a whole, which I mm. think is incredibly important and crucial to, to charting a new course for the nation. It starts in the law, it starts in the legislative body, but also you have responsibilities to your constituency. So you get to do some constituency projects. You get to be the voice of your community at the federal level, and you, bet you get to kind of influence government for, for your people. And I, I think for me and for where I'm starting in my political journey, 
it's the right place. And, you know, nobody goes into a, into a, a, a company right out of university and says, hey, I want to become the CEO. Most times you, you get in somewhere, you're an analyst or an assistant or, you know, mm. some level of executive. And the more that you prove your mettle, the more that you do the kind the of job, then, then maybe going to the ranks is, is a possibility. And I felt very strongly about that. In fact, in 2019, ironically, I think we had 73 people running for president. And the, the votes that we were able to get as an independent candidate in Etiosa alone, we outperformed, I think, 50 people, almost 50 people who were running for president around the country. And so mm -hmm. I think people need to be a bit more realistic about the fact that Nigeria is a big wheel and this is politics. It, and sorry, it doesn't in 2019, take, you were in YPP? I was in MDP, Modern MDP. Democratic Party. But, you know, let's, let's be... If, if impact is really the goal, if we're trying to really get into the system to change things and to do things better, then we must be honest with ourselves. Mm. So I'm not... If, this is me personally. I'm not discouraging anybody from doing what they feel, but I would never have said, eh, you know, I have 5 million followers. Let me run for president. It just... It, it, it doesn't make sense for me. Um, for me, I, I, I've studied the system. I know... Um, how difficult and how complex it is. And so it felt like, okay, House of Reps is the right office for me in terms of impact, in terms of my chances of pulling off the upset to win this election. And make no mistake, it will be an upset for the ages when we do win in 2023. Okay, okay so I mean, so you just mentioned about how social media followership does not translate into actual, yeah. you know, <clears throat> popularity on the ground. So will this just a bit of a detail? Will this okay. in any way have a rub off on the candidacy of Okakidele and, and Jando? Well, I think that, um, first of all, I think people need to look at entertainers as more than entertainment. I think it's, it's interesting how people get into such an uproar when an entertainer decides to run for office, especially when it's an entertainer who has been successful as a business person in entertainment. Oh. So it's one thing to be able to pick up a mic and sing or to get in front of the camera and act. It's another thing to be a business owner in entertainment. That requires a certain level of intelligence. It requires a certain level of competency and character. And you never hear people say things like, oh, why is a lawyer or a banker or an engineer or any other you know, uh, discipline or sector of the economy? Why are they running for office? How many bankers are good? No. But when it comes to people who are business people in entertainment, sometimes there's a stereotype that we want to cast on all entertainers. And I think it's quite unfair. I think that for me, I'm an engineer. I studied engineering, industrial engineering in university. I went to one of the best engineering schools in the world for university. And then I chose. I didn't get into entertainment because I had nothing left to do. I chose because I had a passion for it. And by God's grace, I had the talent for it. And I think even for Funke Akindele, she's a trained lawyer. She's, a, she's an educated person who has brought herself up by her bootstraps and succeeded against the odds in a very difficult place like Nigeria. What entertainment does is it gives you a certain level of popularity, which mm. never hurts, right? It doesn't hurt in politics for you to be a recognizable name and a face and a voice that people know. However, it is your experiences that give you the perspective that you need and the preparation that you need to run for office. And I think people who are successful business people are the people that we need running for office mm. because they've created employment, they've created revenue, They've hired young people. They've had to keep businesses going. They've had to pay salaries. We all went through COVID together. We, we know, business people know what it took to keep your staff paid, to keep the payroll, payroll going month after month when we didn't know where the world was going to and you were making nothing, but you still had to balance the books and make sure people took home something to eat. Business people are the ones who are innovators, who are you know, finding new ways and new solutions and new services and mm. new products, whether that's a movie or, or a piece of music or a phone or a drink or whatever, I think it's business, businessmen and businesswomen that we need. And I think, at least for myself and for Funke Akindele, we're business people. Yes, we're talented and we thank God for that. And, and you know, we can't take credit for that. But we're also very well prepared entrepreneurs who have gone through the system of creating businesses and, and creating ideas and hiring people and putting people to work and generating revenue, not just for ourselves, but for people who are connected to us, for our communities. And I think that that's a plus when it comes to politics. And people should stop 
should give stereotyping. Yeah, give give every business person a chance. I, I mean, I mean, I think the stereotype comes out of you know, like you know, when you see music videos and you know, there's a lot of things that go on in the music yeah, videos. Yeah, of course. Of drinking, I mean, talking, yeah, but, but shaking, even, but even then, you even then you cast a, a very wide net, right? You cast a wide net to assume that everybody who's ever done a music video is doing what you've described. I don't think that that's quite true. Or that everybody who's done a movie, and even for those who have done it, you also have to remember that everybody's on a personal journey of evolving. Absolutely. Right? You're not the same person today that Absolutely. you were a year or two ago or Absolutely. five years ago. Absolutely. And thank God God is God because he doesn't write us off, mm -hmm. right? So why do we not choose to give people the same grace that we expect for ourselves, mm -hmm. right? I'm not mm -hmm. a perfect human being. I've, I have my flaws. I've made my mistakes. I've learned through my life's experiences. Mm -hmm. And we all have. And what you hope is that year on year, day by day, you grow to be a wiser, better, more prepared, more influential, more just, just a better, better person than you were. I mean, when you look in the mirror, that's really a competition. You're trying to be a better man than you were yesterday or a week mm. before. So I think give people the grace to grow. Give people the chance to evolve. And when you see that, then accept it and celebrate it and don't try and you know, the Bible is my favorite book of all time for many reasons. One of my favorite things about the Bible is that it doesn't mask the mistakes of great men. So when a prophet was insecure, it tells you. When a king messed up, it tells you. When somebody fell, it tells mm. you. When Peter denied Jesus, it tells you. It doesn't, it doesn't hide imperfection. imperfection. It doesn't hide, you know, the struggle part of the story. And in these days of social media, we just tend to want to focus and celebrate the high moments, and that's what your influencer or your it girl or it boy wants to show you is when they're turning up. They don't show you when they're battling their demons. Mm -hmm. And I think entertainers, more than probably most people, live their lives in the public. So you've seen them go through everything. You've seen them, whether it's in their personal life mm -hmm. or in their art, you get a front row seat to their lives. And so sometimes do we maybe cast a bit more of a judgment on them because we're privy to see that. But just because the politician that you don't know his every move, you don't really see that, but yet you know, you're more accepting of that than you are of the person who's worn her heart on her sleeve this entire time. And so I, I tip my hat off to Funke Akindele. I think she's an incredibly successful person. I think she's a very educated person. I think she is a plus. I mean, how many deputy governors in Nigeria, can you name off the top of your head? You probably can't name probably, many. In Nigeria? In Nigeria. Absolutely, I can name most of them. Oh, well, well maybe you can, because <laughs> this is your work. But I think most people yes. I don't, but, but, but most people I understand. know. understand, yes, I understand. Yeah, so I, it's understand a, I, I think it, it should be. You know, so I was trying to you know, look at it vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, her um, um, entertainment background, whether to translate to actual votes for her. Right. You know, whether, you know, there's a difference between to be famous and to be popular. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I think she's famous, but I don't know whether she's popular. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, but, politics you know, it, is tricky, right? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's, 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 so it's not just being famous or even being popular. Mm. It's also about do people connect with us? Do people believe that you are truly going to serve That's the popularity. The community? So you're popular amongst the people. Right. I mean, people may know you and say, okay, I know Banky W. Yeah. Uh, I know yeah. Banky. Do you understand? Yeah. But is it yeah. popular amongst the people? Right. You know? right. So that's it. Yeah. But you know, today is about Banky W. Yes. It's not about. Not, shout out to my sister, Your Excellency Ma. <laughs> But yes, I'm the one yes, that's here. She can come for her own interview. <laughs> no problem. So, so, so you, you just mentioned that you, know, you don't really have much faith in um, the local government elections. Yeah. And you're going into office now. Mm -hmm. What do you think, or how would you correct that? Do you think that the INEC should also run local government elections? I, I think in a perfect world they should. I think yeah, but, I mean, but, but shown... the states have um, last check in Lagos. Yes, but and I it's think... it's supposed to be independent. It's supposed to be, but I think from most neutral bystanders who've been observing would say that it's probably not as independent as it should be. Mm. Um, there have been enough allegations that I think we can do better. Let's, let's put it like that. I think we can do better. And I also think that we need to give props to INEC because you can see, if you're really observing what INEC has been doing, they've been taking very intentional steps towards making our elections the freest and fairest that they've ever been. Um, INEC worked with some members of the National Assembly and some, some uh, NGOs and, you know, not-for-profit, you know, NGO mm. society organizations to, put, to bring the Electoral Act. The Electoral Act has done wonders for our democracy. So you have, you have utmost faith in this election? I, you know, listen, I think that from where I sit today, 
we, we are about to have the freest and fairest elections that we've ever had in our democracy. If things play out the way that they've been so far, I think the Electoral Act has done amazing things to move our democracy closer to where it should be. And a democracy is an evolving thing, right? It's not, it's not a final thing. It's something that you, you, you learn your lessons and you, you tweak it and you get better every go around. And I think that mm -hmm. INEC has been incredibly intentional about showing that agency and that initiative to say, we can do this thing better. And I think that's what we want. We just want, let the voice and the will of the people stand. Let it not, let's not go back to the dark ages where candidates are imposed on people. I think that's what everybody in a democracy wants. Mm. Let the will of the people stand, whatever that will is, good or bad, but let it be that as a people we came together and sat down and decided that this is where we want to go. And I think we are closer to having that now than we've ever had. I mean, I must say, I'm also sharing your optimism as well. Yeah. You know, the whole Beavers thing is a game changer. Beavers is a game changer. It's a game changer. 100%. You know, it's going to make the elections a bit more fair and open. Hundred percent. I, I, I agree. And I think you. also the electronic transmission of votes. Um, you know, back in the day, you mentioned Beavers. Back in the day, we used to use this card reader. Mm, they would now mm. say, "Oh, it it's not okay." There. There's a manual accreditation of votes. Then they would go in the back and allegedly stamp, you know, hundreds of votes for mm, whoever mm, they want. Mm, mm. All of that is out the window now. Absolutely. And then even the one of, oh, the, you know, voting has switched everywhere. They are now trans transporting the votes manually from the various hundreds of polling units. The, car may, the, the truck may pull up somewhere and, and walk magic and then show up at the collision center. All of that is done now. Mm, mm. And I think we have to give credit where it's due to INEC, to the members of the National Assembly that pushed it through, to the NGOs and, and the people from civil society who were involved in that fight. Just the same way a lot of us were in the, involved in the fight for Not Too Young to Run. The office of the citizen can be incredibly powerful. And I think that's what we're seeing. That's what a mm. democracy should be. Um, so now with that electoral act in place, the responsibility that candidates have is, can you make sure that in every polling unit in your constituency, you have multiple people there who are committed to watching it and making sure that they will, they will be there from beginning to end, they will watch the votes being counted, they will see the results pasted, and they will send you what those results are, and they will flag any, you know, any incident that happens to go you know, off, off the line, and mm. I think for me, that's the challenge, right? Etiosa has 725 polling units. So we're on a massive recruitment drive of people, young people, especially. 725 polling units. 725. There 25. were 295 in 2019. Okay. They added 430. So now we have 725 right. polling units in Etiosa, mm. which is a massive spread, right? Mm. But that's the challenge. So on that election day, I need to make sure that I have multiple people at every single one of those polling units. And that's why we're calling for volunteers. We're training them. We'll have to pay them. We'll have to take care of them, feed them. But letting them know that we're going to win this thing, and this is the way that we're going to do it, by mm. God's grace. Sounds like a lot of work. It's a lot of work, my brother. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. I just started. <laughs> we're just starting. We're not tired, Jerry. <laughs> so, so, I, I know, so, I mean, why did you make that move from MDP to PDP? Right. So for MDP, um, first of all, what INEC did after 2019 is they deregistered most of the, reg the political parties. Mm. In 2019, we had 96. Yes. They deregistered most of them. I think we have about 18 now. Yeah, I think 18 or 21. Yeah, yeah. Something, something like that. Um, and so MDP itself had been deregistered, so it was no longer an option. But, you know, the truth is, MDP was myself and my brother BK. BK was the chairman of the party. He was running for House of Reps in Ondo State. I was okay. running in Lagos State, and that was it. There was no party. There was no structure. There was nothing. It was just two young, crazy guys that felt like, you know what, get your friends and your fa fa family and your volunteers together. You fight it here. I'll fight it there, and let's see how we do. Um, but one of the lessons that we learned from that time till now is that we have to engage with Nigeria where it is, not where we want it to be. Mm. And that means looking at the political landscape and finding somewhere, I mean, the goal is to get into government, right? The goal is to get into government where you can stand for your values, where you can fight for your people, where you can push the vision that you and your people have for the kind of community and the kind of country that you want to live in. And looking at the landscape with those parameters, it made sense for us to make the call for the PDP. We knew that it was going to be a harder battle because obviously the PDP is not uh, in power in the federal, it's also not in power in the state, so you're the opposition. Mm. But I think democracies need credible op oppositions. Yeah. And you know, people immediately say, oh, but the PDP 
has also caused some of the pain that Nigeria, Nigerians have felt. Okay. And my response is that I'm not in the PDP to defend everything wrong that anybody in the history of PDP has ever done. I'm not in the PDP to defend its history. I'm in the PDP to reform the future. Mm. That's why I'm here. We See, there is no, can you name one church or one mosque or one school or one company or one family that 100% of every member you know, is doing the right thing, saying the right thing, you know, believing what you believe. It doesn't, it doesn't happen, right? It's, systems are a collection of people. Absolutely. So if a and, political and party like the PDP has had its you know, questionable characters, then more good characters need to get into the system. Certainly. And that's the goal. Let's get a collection, a consensus, uh, a, a, a mass of right-thinking, like-minded people to come in and that's what the P 